authorizations and disclosures. In this video, we cover authorizations and disclosures. All right, unit three, unit three. This is authorization, authorizations and disclosures. Okay, unit three, authorizations and disclosures. There's lots of different types of authorizations and disclosures that you can use to obtain taxpayer information from the IRS. Lots and lots and lots. The highest authorization is going to be Form 2848. This allows you to do everything. This allows you to represent the taxpayer. This allows you to um, uh, talk to collections. This allows you to get forms. This allows you to do everything. That's the form that I always use. I don't use anything else. It's not worth it for me. Um, once you have that, you can basically do everything you need to do for the taxpayer. Um, I did. I do give, give, give you a copy of 2848. Right here in this little spot, number spot number three, this is the acts authorized, and you have to put the description of the matter. Okay? You cannot put all matters. They will be rejected. Usually what we just put is income tax. If we're dealing with a payroll tax issue, we will put income tax and payroll tax. Um, you can add more to this list, okay, if you wish, but if you don't get the type of income tax that's on there or the type of tax that's on there and then later you have to deal with the payroll tax issue, uh, then they're going to make you get another one. So that's a pain in the butt. So if you think you might have a payroll tax issue and an income tax issue, put them both on there, okay? Uh, oh, and they even have a new thing on here for the shared responsibility payment. See that? That's considered a separate tax issue now because it's ACA. So if you're dealing with ACA, you got to put that on there too. You see that right here? Description of the matter. Income, employment tax, payroll, excise, estate, gift, whistleblower, um, practitioner discipline, um, FOIA, um, shared responsibility payment. So it's a big long list. <clears throat> it didn't used to be like that. That little, that little thing used, that little descriptor used to just say description of tax matter. But now the IRS really wants you to tell them what you're going to be doing. So just fill it up. You can do that. You also have to put the tax form number. So for example, if it's a 1040, let's say you have a sole proprietor with employees, then you got to put the 1040 and you got to put the 941. You got to put both. And then years or periods, you cannot just put all periods, all years. You got to put years. If I have a, okay, there's a uh, school of thought with this. There's a school of thought with this. Some tax practitioners are very obsessive about the years or periods because they charge the people uh, based on the year that they are representing them. Okay. They get a 2848. If they're representing you for tax year 2015, they only put 2015 on there. Because their, their idea, their impetus behind that, is that if, um, if they find a problem with 2014 too, then that's a separate engagement and they're going to charge you for that. So they would want a new contract for that. That is a school of thought. I don't like that uh, school of thought because I don't want to be keep calling people back into my office to sign multiple forms. So... If I have a taxpayer and I'm representing them for 2015, I'll usually go back at least five years because I know that if 2015 has a problem, a lot of times 2014 has a problem too. Okay? All right. And with delinquent filers, you don't know how far the rabbit hole goes. You know what I mean? Um, it's okay for you to do something and put like 20 years on there. You can put like the year 2000 through the year 2016. That's perfectly allowable. I've done that a couple of times when it's a family member where they're a delinquent filer because um, I know I'm just going to be going back and going back to clean up their mess. A separate Form 28 must be completed for each taxpayer who wishes representation. This is kind of new. Uh, 2848 used to be able to be signed by a married couple. All right. In filling out a Form 2848, the rep must enter the designation under which he's authorized to practice. Okay. <clears throat> if you are an EA, you put your designation with which is a C. 
I should memorize that letter, but you put C right here, and then your licensing or jurisdiction is going to be the IRS. I usually put IRS and then I slash it and I put federal, because that's our licensing is federal. Um, if it is a CPA, they are licensed by the state. So if, if you're a CPA in California, then you would put the designation of CPA with this B, right? And then you put your licensing as California, or CA. And then you have to put your license number in the third box, then you put your signature here, and then you put the date. Okay? That's how it works. A power of attorney ends upon death. A newly filed power of attorney will also revoke a previously filed power of attorney. And that makes sense, right? If I have a taxpayer who is using Jim Jones CPA and he didn't really like how Jim Jones CPA was doing his thing, and then he comes to me, then it's going to revoke the, the existing 2848 that's out there, and the new one is going to supersede it, okay? Okay. Uh, I will tell you, you can revoke, uh, the taxpayer can revoke. A power of attorney is going to be valid until death or revocation by the taxpayer or until the representative withdraws from representation. I have not had a lot of luck withdrawing from representation when I have had it to, client, to fire clients for non-payment or something like that. The IRS will still continue to send me notices forever and they go into the circular file, right, or they get shredded, because I don't want to deal with that. But um, like if a person stops paying me or they neglect to pay me, I'm not going to represent them anymore. And with, with their the thing, they say, if, if the taxpayer is revoking, uh, they've got to put revoke across the top of the first page. Taxpayers never do this. If they stop paying you, they just, they just stop paying you and they go on with their lives and doing whatever tax cheat stuff they're doing. Um, so, but that's the procedure. They're supposed to revoke it by putting revoke up there. If you, the representative, is withdrawing from representation, you put withdraw at the top of the first page um, of the 2848. The revocation has to be mailed or faxed to the IRS. If I try to fax it, I put withdraw. They see, they kind of, they ignore it because I still keep getting notices. But, um, but I have tried to do this before. But that's the procedure. You can withdraw from representation if you wish. They will still try to call you and contact you and everything else, especially if the taxpayer tries to like drop off the face of the earth. Sometimes they don't have any way to contact them and they'll contact you. And usually I say I fired them and I don't know where they are. Okay, durable power of attorney. Durable power of attorney is not something that you are ever going to do. Okay, a durable power of attorney is what happens when a lawyer steps in and creates a durable power of attorney for a taxpayer. That is a common thing but you cannot prepare a durable power of attorney. You're, you're, you're an EA. However, sometimes you will see durable power of attorneys with the taxpayer. A lot of times this will happen when you have a taxpayer who's very old or sick and, ha and is on at the level where maybe they're going to not be able to take care of their own affairs anymore. So that's when I see these. Uh, they're pretty common once the, once the, tax prepare, once the taxpayer start, goes into a home, like an old folks home, this, these wheels start turning. Um, I've also seen one for a taxpayer who had a uh, power of attorney, durable power of attorney for a son who was mentally ill um, and had to be uh, 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 permanently hospitalized. So the IRS will accept a non-IRS power of attorney, but it has to contain all the same information pr uh, present on a standard IRS form 2848. The durable power of attorney, unlike the form 2848, is not subject to a time limit. And it will continue in force after the inc incapacitation or incompetency of the individual. So they're very unusual in that respect. Um, a durable power of attorney is terminated upon the death of the individual. That's when it's terminated. An ordinary power of attorney is generally revoked when the person is found to be incompetent. But a durable power of attorney can only be revoked by the person who made it and it will continue even after the person um, uh, is deemed incompetent, okay? It will continue in force, so it's very unusual in that regard. Enrolled practitioners. Remember, so enrolled practitioners are, is not just EAs. Whenever you say enrolled practitioners, we're talking about attorneys and CPAs too. They're under that umbrella. They can represent a taxpayer between before any office of the IRS. So you can represent a taxpayer before collections, 
appeals, and the examination division. Okay? Those are the main areas of representation that you are going to be doing. You can also record an interview or meeting with the IRS. You can record them. You can record them on a recorder. Um, I've never actually had this done because you have to tell them you're going to record. You can't just like record surreptitiously. I've never had this done and I wouldn't want to be in a position where you were recording the, the IRS because they get really mad about that kind of stuff. So you, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot um, if you do stuff like that. But you are allowed to record the interview. You are allowed to sign a waiver or restriction of assessment on behalf of the taxpayer. You, you, the taxpayer is generally the one that signs this, but if you have proper authorization on 2848, you can sign on their behalf. I generally don't do this, but I have done it for a family member who was terrified of the IRS and didn't want to um, deal with them, so I have signed on their behalf. Um, you can sign consents to extend the statutory time period for assessment or collection of tax. You can do that. You can sign a closing agreement. A closing agreement is when you, you have a situation where you're, uh, you're going to agree. You, maybe, you, maybe you lost on the meals and entertainment, but you won on the travel. And the taxpayer, this is all, this is what happens, right, in reality. And the taxpayer says, look, man, if you can get me out of this problem for less than 1500 bucks, just sign it and close it and let it be done. So you have that dollar amount in your head, and you start to nego you negotiate with the IRS and say, uh, okay, his meals and entertainment receipts aren't great, but, you know, because of the Cohan rule, right, uh, you, you know, you got to give me something. You got to give me at least part of it because you can't disallow all of it. You know, you you know that the, the taxpayer had some of these expenses and it's legitimate. Um, and also the travel, we've got a pretty pretty good travel log. You know, I can prove that he's like doing a lot of blah 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 blah. And so you guys go, they go back and forth. You go back and forth and you say, ah, you know, okay, I'll give you fifty percent of this and turn seventy five percent of that. All right, that's how it actually happens. If you get to that magical number that you and the taxpayer have kind of agreed to, sometimes the taxpayer doesn't want to close. They, they want to fight. But they got to pay you, right? It's, you're not free. So, so most of the time, if you get kind of a good number where the taxpayer is happy, we'll close the audit and it'll be done. Okay? Qualified representative can represent the taxpayer before the IRS without the taxpayer present as long as the proper power of attorney is signed and submitted to the IRS. A lot of times they want the taxpayer to be there because they know the taxpayer is the one that's going to open their mouth and make a mistake and say stuff that they don't, they shouldn't. Um, we never let the taxpayer be there. We tell them you can't, we got to stay home, right? Even if the taxpayer is like, I, I, I can fight this, no. And whenever they go and they try to represent themselves, they screw it up and then they got to, and then we got to fix it afterwards. And a lot of times if they've already gone once, they, they've admitted to things that they shouldn't have and we can't fix that after the fact, you know, it's very difficult. Right. But if we're if we are representing the taxpayer from the outset, that's the best possible scenario. And then we tell the taxpayer just don't, don't, don't talk to them. Don't say anything. Don't just be quiet. Okay. Representative signing in lieu of taxpayer. Um, I looked this up because I wanted to know if a practitioner had ever been in trouble for doing this incorrectly, and the answer is yes. A tax practitioner can sign on behalf of a client. I do not do that. Uh, you don't sign the taxpayer's name. You sign your name as if you are a representative. You've got to have a 2848 already. The only exception to that is like if you're signing for your kid, right? If you're a parent signing for a kid, then that's allowable, right? Because they're a minor child, you're the parent. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a representative who already has a valid power of attorney. They are not permitted to sign a tax return unless... The signature is permitted under the Internal Revenue Code, and uh, the taxpayer specifically grants the signature authority on the power of attorney. That is not something that's automatic, okay? They have to have that box checked right here that says, uh, additional acts authorized. In addition to the acts three listed above, I authorize my representative to perform the following acts. You have to have authorization to authorize disclosure to third parties, Substitute or add an additional representative and also sign a taxpayer's return. That is not automatic. Those three things, the taxpayer needs to check those boxes before you before you are allowed to do any of those things. Okay? IRS regulations only allow a representative to 
and taxpayers return if the taxpayer is unable to sign for because of disease or injury. So, like, if you have a taxpayer who's completely paralyzed, I have had one case like this where the taxpayer could only move their head and their neck. I still did not sign their tax return. But I could have signed their tax return if I wanted to. They could not, uh, they have a debilitating disease. So they could not sign, so I could sign. Do you know that if, the, if you have a, this is kind of like as an aside, but do you know if a taxpayer um, can't sign, as, as any signature is acceptable? Like if they put the pen in their mouth and go like that, that's a signature. That's a legal signature. Because they're doing it. They're doing whatever they can do. Yeah. They have to have, uh, or they have to have continuance, continuing absence from the United States, including Puerto Rico, for a period of at least 60 days prior to the date required by law for filing the return. Other good cause if specific permission is requested and granted. So if there's another reason, you have to ask, and the IRS has to grant you permission to do it. I can't think of any other reason why you would want to do it, but other good cause if specific permission is required and granted. I did look this up to see if a tax professional had ever gotten in trouble for this, and the answer was yes. There was a tax attorney who um, signed, uh, and I don't remember the name of the case, but I looked it up this week. It was a tax attorney who signed on behalf of the taxpayer while the taxpayer was outside the U.S., but the taxpayer had only been outside the U.S. like two weeks. They were like world travelers. So they did not hit this 60-day requirement. He put his own name on the return, and he filed the return with the 2848. The IRS actually took a long time to, to send them the notice. And the, wet, the, the notice that they sent the taxpayer was that they, for, they had a huge penalty for non-filing. The lawyer got involved and said, they filed. You know, I filed the return myself. And the IRS said, you may have filed, but this is not the taxpayer's signature down here. And the attorney said, well, I have power of attorney. And they said, does the taxpayer have a debilitating injury or illness? And the answer was no. And the attorney also, uh, the, tax, the taxpayers were like wealthy and they didn't deal with any of his own stuff. You know what I mean? So super rich dude and lady and they were just traveling and they just didn't want to deal with it. So they gave power of attorney to the lawyer and the lawyer did all of their stuff. But the idea is that the lawyer signed, but they, it was not one of these exceptions. And the IRS said, well, they, were, they, um, were they continuously absent from the United States for a, for a period of at least 60 days prior? They did not have proof that they were continuously absent. They had not been continuously absent. They just didn't want to deal with it, and they told the lawyer to sign it. And the lawyer signed it. And so they had delinquent filing, uh, failure to file, failure to file, failure to, uh, failure to pay, um, failure to uh, file on time, and failure to sign, and then negligence penalties on top of all of that. And they went after the attorney too. Like, you should have known better, right? So all of them got slapped. So don't do this. Just don't do it, and you will not, not have a problem. Um, like I said, I have done it uh, one occasion only, and it was for a family member. And of course I signed my kids' returns. But um, I'm not going to do it for, for a client. No, 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 no. Okay, now we're talking about the 8821. The 8821 is not the same as the 2848. The 8821 is just a tax information authorization. This does not allow you to advocate for the taxpayer in any way. The 8828 is what I used when I, before I was an enrolled agent whenever I needed to get information for a, t for a taxpayer, like if I wanted to get transcripts and see what was going on. And whenever you have a delinquent taxpayer, you know you've got to request the wage and income, right? They're, they're, you know that they've got like W-2s and 1099 sitting out there that you haven't seen because their records suck. Um, in that case, we get the tax information authorization, which is the 8821, and you fax it to the IRS, and then you get all the transcripts so that you can see what's going on. That does not give you any kind of loss. Anybody can use this, any third party. This is what's used by banks. Banks, when you're trying to get a mortgage, they'll have the taxpayer sign this because they don't trust the form that you gave them, right? They want to see what was actually filed with the IRS because people will do jimmy jams and try to cheat, right? They will say, I made $150,000 last year. And then when they go and they look at the return, that Schedule C with the huge loss is missing out of it, right? So anybody can use this, including an entity, a bank, 
As long as this is signed, they can request uh, transcript information. Okay, you got to know what the CAF is. The CAF is right here, the CAF number. All of you should have a CAF number. If you don't have a CAF number, go home and request one. You just, uh, like I said, I requested my first CAF number when I put my family member on here. And um, I feel like even if you don't have a reasonable reason to or get a CAF number right now, just put your kid on there and represent your kids so you can get your CAF number rolling, okay? A CAF, you're going to represent them anyway, right? A CAF number is, a, is short for Centralized Computer Authorization File. And the CAF is a centralized computer database that, that for the IRS representatives and collections and every other area of the IRS, when you give them the CAF number, it matches you up to the taxpayer that you are representing, okay? Um, that doesn't mean that you can't represent a taxpayer if you don't have one of these filed yet. You can call up the practitioner line, the practitioner priority line, if you have this in your hand and you can say, I just got the 2848 today and I can fax it to you today. Because putting the information into the CAF file takes like two weeks. The IRS doesn't do it automatically. But um, if you fax them, if you fax the IRS this, it gets the ball rolling. Sometimes you know if you're busy, you don't have time to deal with that taxpayer at this point anyway. I've got like 10 of them sitting on my desk right now that I can't deal with until I come back from my vacation. Um, they can sit for, for a little bit. Um, the CAF number is assigned to a tax practitioner when the 48, 2048 or a form 8821 is filed. A CAF number will also allow the IRS to automatically send notices, copies of notices. So whenever I'm representing a taxpayer, I always check that box. I want to get the notices because the taxpayer, a lot of times, they won't give them to me. There's so a surprising amount of uh, a surprising amount of Americans do not open their mail for some reason. Um, I am shocked and dismayed by this because I always open all my mail. You never know if there's going to be a check in there, right? <laughs> but I will get like a stack. So I've had multiple, multiple, multiple clients that will come in with a bag. And it's like the notices are not even open. It's like you didn't even look at this. This, uh, this is dated like four months ago. How do you not open your mail? So I want to get copies of the notices because a lot of times people who come in and say I never got this, they did get that. It's sitting in a huge box of junk underneath their kitchen table that they never bothered to open. A third party designee. Third party designee is not the same as the 8821 or the 2048. It's, it's right here on uh, page two of the 1040. It's right here, third party designee. And you can put anybody's name in there. Um, when we prepare a tax return, it's always us, right? But we are the third party designee. This allows us to call the Internal Revenue Service and exchange verbal information with them. Like, where's my refund is why was, was when I ever, when I always do the third party designee. Uh, taxpayer wants to know when the refund is gonna be there. It's six months late, blah, 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 blah. It's very easy. Uh, the IRS you will usually talk to me and they won't ask me to send in a 2848, which is fine. The third party designee <coughs> automatically will expire on the due date of the next tax return. So. <coughs> It's generally only good for like refund issues. Um, I haven't found that it's um, useful for anything else. You got to know that this is called, this is also called the checkbox authority because a taxpayer technically is checking a box to give you authorization to speak with the IRS on their behalf. And there's a box right here. Do you want to allow another person to discuss this return with the IRS? See instructions. Question mark. And then there's a little box right there that says yes. And our software automatically checks that, right? The taxpayer doesn't do it, but um, as long as they sign a return, they're agreeing to that. They're supposed to be looking at it. Um, the designee is also allowed to receive written account information, including transcripts upon request. Uh, I, I haven't found that I've um, <coughs> that it's been useful for that. Only only for refund information. But if you have a transcript issue, you can request it using your third party designee only. A designee cannot receive a tax refund check on a client's behalf. Only if you have a 2848, a valid 2848, can you receive a tax refund check on a client's behalf. Apparently, apparently, I never receive a tax refund check for taxpayer. That's not something that I do. 
But apparently this is very common with attorneys. <coughs> they will get a copy of the tax refund check sent to them all the time. And that's because what ends up happening is that a lot of times when an attorney represents a client, they change everything on the return to their address. So everything will go to the attorney, including the tax refund check. The fact that they're an attorney does not give them the right to cash the refund check, but they want to see it and it comes to them. I don't do that, but I could if I wanted to. I do not do that. Okay, this is what it looks like. The third party designee goes here, right? Designee's name. So this third party designee signs here. Our software puts it in for us, right? We don't do that. Um, but if we were writing a tax, if we were writing it by hand, that's where it would go. And we put our phone number there, okay? Then we say yes, and then we put a pin in there. Usually I choose a zip code. Is, is that what you guys do? Do you guys use that as a zip, a zip code? I use the taxpayer's zip code because it's five digits. And then I know every time if they ask me for the pin, it's going to match the taxpayer's zip code. So, so that's I, what I use. I use the pin. That's the pin that I use for all the taxpayers. I use their zip code. Makes it easy. Tax return copies and transcripts. Okay. If a taxpayer needs an actual copy of his own tax return, he may use Form 4506. This is not as useful as it used to be because now you just get the e-file record, which is just a bunch of digits sitting on a piece of paper. I don't want that. I want the PDF, you know? I want to see what the tax return looks like. And you think that it's the same, but it's not, right? It's not. Have you ever, well, you guys, maybe not, but I, I've been in an audit before where the tax uh, auditor comes in with a transcript and there is a lot of information missing from that transcript. One thing that I have noticed, and this is something that I noticed, I haven't done a rep case like this in a while, but I had a real estate guy who's a real estate agent, not a real estate professional. All his money was coming in from being a real estate agent. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars, so he was very uh, busy. And we had nicely and correctly broken out all of his internet, telephone, uniform, stuff da -da 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 -da, on the other expense income line. When they came in with the, the return receipt file, when the auditor came in with a copy of her return, she doesn't have the PDF, I have the PDF. She had the e-file transcript, right? Then the number, the, what they had for the other line was a gigantic $50,000 number. And that's when I realized this is what's triggering the freaking audit. It's this gigantic number that's not broken out at all because all the numbers are perfect. I spent all this time doing the bookkeeping. And that's when I figured out if you have a bunch of stuff sitting in the other line, the IRS is not getting that detail. It's not transmitting. You're putting it into your software, but they're not getting that. And so when, what ends up happening is it's raising the taxpayer's diff score because you've got this huge number in the other. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's my take on it, right? Because I saw those numbers myself. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the PDF, the return that I filed, and I have everything broken out nice. I got the 2000 for the internet. I got like 2000 for the cell phone. I got the uh, continuing education. I've got the live classes out there. And it was all broken out. And all of the expenses that I had there were like reasonable numbers. They weren't crazy. But when the auditor came, all of a sitting there was a big $50,000. And we won that audit because when she looked at that, she's like, oh, looks good. That's fine. The bookkeeping was done. But I had to go through all that rigmarole for nothing. So now what I do is if I have a Schedule C taxpayer, I try to, all the stuff on the other line, I try to bring it up into the actual categories, right? I don't put websites in down and down in other. I put website in advertising. That's kind of what it is, right? If you have a website, you're advertising and you're paying for that. I try to put the stuff back up into the form rather than into that catch-all other. Because I know, I know it's not, that information's not being transmitted. And I think that when you have a big number on that line, that's what's causing the audit. I don't have any proof of that. 
But I do know that as soon as I showed her the PDF of the return, she kind of was like, yeah, that's fine. Right? But that took 10 hours out of my week. I don't like that. When was this happen? When did this happen? <sighs> Like how long? 2011? Yeah. 2011. My, my old CPA told me to do that as well, to bring everything up on the first page, especially the big ticket items. As much as you can. Yeah. It just try to fit it into their category. Category. Right. You're not doing anything unethical. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, exp the expense is legitimate. Mm -hmm. It's just instead of like trying to break it out so that it seems nicer for them, which I thought the detail would be better, mm -hmm. but in fact the detail is worse. Mm -hmm. It's worse for your client to have more detail. I've been planning uh, Schedule C for trucking companies for a long time. Yeah. I didn't have that problem because I've been putting fuel because they have a lot of... Yeah, them. fuel is not going to... The thing is, is that... Okay, we'll go over like the diff score and how that but happens. The, the fuel comes up on page one under auto. Have you been hard coding it on page two? No, I just went to it. Yeah, it brings on yeah, when you put it in the auto expense it carries over to the op to the first page one mm -hmm. of the uh, Yeah, I, I know, I, I remember it. Uh, we could do that the, uh, in the auto too. But yeah. I didn't. Yeah. I haven't done that. It's, I, this is up to you. What I'm telling you right now is my opinion. I don't have any proof of that. Because the IRS does not release any of the diff stuff pub that's not public. Um, I, it's a huge, it's a very um, interesting area of tax law, and there are multiple tax attorneys that have written books on the IRS audit um, function, the diff score, because the IRS, every year somebody tries to request that information, the IRS always blocks them. Yeah, and, and their algorithms are getting their better. Their algorithms are getting uh, better. They're getting better and better. It's like uh, 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 AI, you know, artificial yeah, intelligence, intelligence, right? So you have to be very careful to like circumvent. I mean, not not you know. I mean, to 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 prepare an accurate tax return, of course, but not to trigger the you know for the them dip. to go out, yeah. out of the diff normal score. Yeah. Right. So that's that's another consideration now that we have to think about. You know, I have to think about that. Yeah. You know, what what can I do to this to have it reflect? accurately but not trigger yeah the the diff audit side of this medium range and they come out here then, then they they're, they're going to get a notice they're yeah they're going to pull the return. return uh the thing is is that so, i mean i've had preparers argue with me like you just file the return accurately and and uh -oh. you should be fine i don't uh -oh. want that like i don't want the the irs to come in and audit the taxpayer because it pisses off the taxpayer they think that i've done something wrong number one they get scared and I don't represent taxpayers for free, so, the, and a lot of times they'll be like trying to blame it on me. It's because they don't want to pay me. And then on top of that, I don't want an auditor to come in and just sit there and look at the tax return and say, oh, uh, looks like everything's right. We just will close the audit. Because that's not, that screws my day. I can spend like eight hours sitting there talking to them about stuff. Well, where's this? Oh, where's that? And you see this? And you see that? I don't want that. It's, I want to file tax returns. I don't want to deal with rep cases. I don't like it. So anything that I can do to make my job easier in the future so I don't get notices during the off-season, right. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Okay. Anyway, copies of uh, tax returns are generally available for the current tax year and the past six years. Uh, you can go further. You can go back further and get transcripts, but they're all electronic and some of them are kind of uh, iffy. Um, I have gone back really far before when I had a when I had a person who was seriously delinquent and they were and the IRS had been garnishing them forever. Transcripts are available for the current year and the past three years. Form 45, 4506 T, that's the transcript request, obviously does not uh, authorize an individual to represent a taxpayer from the IRS either. Okay, get transcript on IRS.gov. Uh, IRS is a funny creature. They really want to get with the times and do everything over the internet, right? But they keep, they keep like falling victim to scammers. It's almost like there's a target on their back. Uh, the get transcript function was launched in 2014. By May of 2015, it had been pulled off because over 1 million tax accounts had been compromised by scammers. And I think 
that the majority of the calls that you are receiving where they go, this is the IRS and you need to pay us and transfer us the money, otherwise we're gonna send the police to your house and blah, blah, blah. All those scammers that are scaring all the people, I think a lot of the people that they are targeting are people that they stole the information off the IRS website using this stupid tool. Because what ends up happening is these scammers will call the taxpayer and they will have all their information. They'll have their social security number, They'll have their income, they'll have where they worked before, they'll know where their address is, they have all of this information. Where'd they get that information? If it's some dude uh, overseas that's doing the scammy stuff, where'd they get that information? I think they got it here, right? Get Transcript was severely compromised. The IRS pulled it off May 2015, so it's like only valid, only active for like a year. And in that year, there was Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of taxpayers' private information was released to scammers. A taxpayer may still use the, it's still, the button is still there. You can still use Get Transcript feature, and what they do is that you order the transcript and the IRS will send it to you by snail mail. So it's basically the same as using a transcript request, although you can just do it online if you wish. Okay, privacy of tax taxpayer information. This is uh, section 7216. Oh, just so you guys know, if you see this squiggle, See that squiggle? That means section, section number. So the IRC section number. I don't think that you have to know most section numbers. I don't think it's important for the, IR, uh, the IRS exam. However, the exception to that rule is section 7216. The IRS is rabid about this, like crazy, 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 crazy. This is a criminal provision, okay? It's criminal. There's civil penalties too, but criminal means if I disclose this information, I can go to jail as a tax professional. Jail, not just monetary. Okay? This means that you cannot recklessly disclose tax return information. There is a fine of up to $1,000 or in prison for each violation or both. They can tax you with the fine and the prison. There is also a civil penalty of $250 for each improper disclosure. And that's a different section number. That's section number 6713. So that's a civil provision. The difference between these two is they can tax you with that civil penalty even if it's no, knowing or reckless. So that's accidental. I accidentally disclose, right? If I accidentally disclose, they can still get me. But it's civil instead of criminal. If I do it intentionally, then, then I've got a lot of problems. The case that I told you about where it was the preparer, where it was a contentious divorce, and the husband <coughs> called up and got all the information on the wife, got all her W-2s, got all her, got the thing. The, t the taxpayer is entitled to the return itself because it's a joint return. You, you don't withhold that. So in that case, I would give them the return. But if they ask specifically, if they're like, oh, I need all my wife's W-2s, then you should be like, ding, 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 your red flags should be going off. That's bad. And I also get real nervous if it's a parent calling for a child's information, if the child's already past the age of majority. Once they turn 18, I'm like, you know, can you have little Timmy call me? We didn't do that. The thing is, is that it's generally not a problem unless you get a complaint. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is a lot of times these divorces get contentious. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be involved in that. A lot of times I have to kick one of them loose. A lot of them start off as friends. Yeah. Too, but then it's... Yeah. Like, I've never seen it end up as friends. One time, usually when there's when it's money, like they can, they, I, the only times I've had it where they where they haven't end up ended up really hating each other is if they're not arguing about money and one's not like trying to get alimony or child support out of the other one. They're like 50-50 on the kid. We each do our own thing. But if you have either the husband or the wife asking for alimony, there's a problem. I had we had another case where it was the the wife made a ton of money. The wife made a ton of money. And she, and she was a comptroller for a company, big company. So she was an accountant. She wasn't a tax accountant, but she was an accountant. She was making like a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. The husband worked for the state and he made like 40. So the husband was arguing that he deserved alimony from the wife. He was requesting alimony from the wife. 
And that divorce was probably the most contentious divorce we've ever had. So the husband, I think, um, got caught um, with some extracurricular activities. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much proof the wife had, but it was enough that the wife like flipped out. And I think that California is a no-fault state, right? So even if it's uh, there's adultery, then, yeah. Right. So I don't know if she had like pictures of him or she he got like Facebook messages or what. I don't know the, the deal. But the husband started wanted um, alimony from the wife, and he would call us all the time and try to get her information because she was like roadblocking him. You know, she was an accountant. She knew what she was doing. She was like, I'm going to reduce my income. And da, 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 da. She was doing all this stuff to reduce her taxable income so that she wouldn't have to pay him alimony, right? But, but yeah, that was, that was a contentious divorce. And he would call and try to get information. Did my wife come in? We cannot tell you that. Did she file her tax return? We cannot tell you that. Can you give me a copy of our joint return from 2011 and also all the forms? We'll send you a copy of the joint return, but we're not going to send you the other stuff. You know, I didn't want to be involved in that mess. It's just a mess, and it, the wife ended up n not wanting to be our client anymore because of that, because she was afraid that we were going to disclose at some point, which I guess I can't blame her, but yeah. So in that case, this would have been, I don't know what it would have been. It would have been improper disclosure either way. So we could not discuss anything about the wife. Not if she'd come in, not where she was, not where she lived, not her address, none of that. And he kept asking kept asking, would stop asking. Okay, so, so for the purposes of the tax return information, this includes the taxpayer's name, mailing address, of course their social security number, and their EIN of their business. So, okay, let's say they have their business on Google with all of the address of the business on Google, and they are putting their business out there. Let's say they even put their EIN on their website for whatever reason, right? Let's say they do that, and it's all public. You cannot, ha the fact that it's public and he put it out there does not give you the authorization for you to give it to anybody else, right? You can say, hey, Google it if you want to look it up, but you are not allowed to disclose anything that you have collected from the taxpayer at, with regards to biographical information. This includes the names of dependents when you have a divorced couple or an unmarried couple. What do you do then? <coughs> you have an unmarried couple and they got two kids together. The solution for us is we need to have them both sitting in front of us, right? If you're both sitting in front of me, then you guys are disclosing information to each other. But, you know, I don't want just one boyfriend coming in and then the girlfriend coming in you know, a lot of times they'll own property together and they've got a, uh, they got a mortgage. And then, and then we get, I don't want that mess. I'm, get, I'm scared. I want them to both come in together and sit there and talk to me. That's what I want. I certainly can't give him a copy of her return, right? Even if they own property together, even if they live together, even if they have a joint bank account. I can't fix that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's not a word. It's easier when you write it down. Yeah. But information, whether on whether the return was filed or was not examined or was subject to an investigation. Although uh, tax, you can't give any uh, tax balance due collection history, sometimes banks will want this information. I don't, you know what I mean? When they're going through a mortgage, the bank, I, the bank will call me and try to get stuff. I'm like, I don't give you nothing. I'll tell, t t tell the taxpayer to call me and tell the taxpayer to tell me what he needs and I'll send it to him and then he can give you everything he wants. Yeah, a lot of times the brokers will call me. I'm like, what are you, t you are crazy. I'm not giving you that. Allowable disclosures. In certain circumstances, a preparer may disclose information to a second taxpayer. You know, you can always disclose information to the IRS, right? If the IRS calls and asks, there is no penalty whatsoever if you, they, they want you to disclose to them. So that's not what I'm talking about. You, should, you can also disclose to like the police if they come and ask you. And there's no penalty for that either. Or if you get a court summons and a court order, you can always disclose, all right? But um, if it's just taxpayers, you are allowed to disclose if the second, payer is, second taxpayer is related to the first taxpayer. If the first taxpayer's interest cannot be adverse to the second taxpayer's interest. A lot of times you have a situation like that when you've got two MFS returns. They can be married, but one disclosure could be adverse to the other party, and then you've got to tread lightly. 
the first taxpayer can also prohibit the disclosure, and I've had that too. I've had that too, where the wife didn't want the hubby to know about her little problem that she had on the side with gambling. Um, yeah. Don't tell my husband about this, and then I'm, and then it's uncomfortable for me. I don't, I don't, I don't like that. A taxpayer is considered related to another taxpayer. Oh. We had, a, I had a colleague, this was not me, thankfully, who had um, a, a husband and wife in his office. <sighs> had a husband and wife in his office and he was a salesman on a Schedule C. And the wife did work for him of, as like a secretary, right? And, um, but not all the time. And the tax preparer was looking at the salesman's uh, uh, was looking at the salesman's Schedule C and his travel expenses. And the husband and wife were sitting there, and he was looking at the travel expenses, and most of the hotels were, like, charging for two people, and the meals were for two people. And so um, the professional, who was an enrolled agent, goes, look, you guys, um, I, I know you travel a lot for your business, but you're going to get in trouble if you keep taking your wife along if you don't have a legitimate reason. And the wife goes, I don't ever go along on his business trips. And she says, and she, he said that the salesman's face went white, like as white as a sheet. Do you know what he was doing? He was cheating. He was cheating. So he brought his girlfriend along. And she said, um, the colleague was like terrified at that point that he was going to get in trouble for some kind of accidental disclosure. Um, yeah, the, the, the meeting actually like ended shortly thereafter and then the taxpayers never came back. So what liability do you have then? That's a bad situation, right? Because he goes, he goes, he's looking at all the stuff and that's when, that's a situation that's adverse. He's looking at all the stuff and he's like, look, man. But they're filing a joint return and he was Maybe not going, anymore. Well, I mean, at the yeah. time. He right? was just, and yeah. And he was just going over the receipts and going over, you know, yes. what's in compliance, what yes. he's in <laughs> Yeah. She goes, I don't ever go along with him on his business trips. I'll stay with him at the hotel. And the guy went, bleach. Bleach. His face was like, bleach. Yeah, like desitin. You know the stuff you put on the baby's bottom? I see a lot of that because I'm still changing diapers at home. His face is like desitin, like clown face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, the taxpayer is considered related to another taxpayer if it's a husband and wife, a minor child and a parent. Do you see this minor child? An adult child, you might have a problem. Once they start getting on their own and they don't want to be claimed as a dependent anymore, um, a minor child and a parent, a grandchild and a grandparent. Grandchild and a grandparent, I think, is kind of unusual, right? Because the grandchild, the grandparent wouldn't necessarily be claiming the child, but it's in there. It's in the it's in the pubs. A general partner and a partnership, and a trust or estate and the beneficiary, a corporation and a shareholder. Consent is not required. A tax preparer is not required to obtain disclosure consent if they are disclosing private taxpayer information because of a court order or subpoena, an administrative demand from the IRS, or to report a crime to the proper authorities. If you report that you think somebody's embezzling money, or if you think somebody is dealing drugs, or whatever, you can, if you want to, report the crime to the proper authorities. Even if the preparer is mistaken and there no crime has occurred, he will not be subject to sanctions if he makes the disclosure in good faith. You can also uh, disclose biographical taxpayer information for the purpose of peer reviews. CPAs have to do this. CPAs have to do peer reviews to keep their licenses up. So in that case, they're allowed to do peer reviews and, the, and it's okay. Okay, confidentiality privilege. Confidentiality privilege. If you're an enrolled practitioner, you are allowed a limited <coughs> confidentiality privilege. Limited. This is called the FATUB. FATUB. The Federally Authorized Tax Practitioner Confidentiality Privilege. 
It applies to attorneys, although attorneys get um, criminal privilege as well. They get basically unlimited privilege. But it also applies to CPAs and enrolled agents and enrolled actuaries as well. It is limited. It is only with the IRS. It doesn't apply to any other federal agency. So if the IRS uh, comes knocking, then you might be able to say, I have confidentiality privilege with this information. But if the FBI comes knocking, you cannot. So if the FBI comes knocking, you have no confidentiality privilege and you need to, uh, you need to regurgitate the information that they are asking for. The protection of this privilege only applies to tax advice. The confidentiality protection applies to non-criminal tax matters before the IRS or non-criminal tax proceedings brought in federal court against the United States. Remember this because this has been on prior exams. They will ask you, when does the confidentiality privilege apply? And it's only in these two situations. That's it. No other time. <clears throat> The confidentiality privilege does not apply in criminal tax matters. Now, I, I, I have never been in an IRS audit situation where I have tried to assert this. I feel like that kind of would cause problems. And since I'm not an attorney, I can't like take it to the limit. I can't go, I'm going to claim confidentiality privilege on that. It's kind of, it would kind of like create a wall at that point, right, if the IRS is asking. But I never voluntarily give the IRS information that they haven't asked for, okay? If they are asking me for something, then I will give it to them. But if they forget to ask me for something, and perhaps I know after, the, after talking to the taxpayer that they have created, a, that they have like some missing information or missing income on the return. I do not have to volunteer that information and I do not, okay? But if I do sniff that there is a possibility that there is a criminal problem, I kick, I kick the client out. I refer them to an attorney. They need a COBOL letter and I'm, and I'm not gonna be involved in that. Attorneys, of course, retain, retain confidentiality and privilege in all matters, including criminal and non-criminal matters. Would you, the thing that you can tell is if, if you go into an audit and you sit down and the examiner sits down and then another guy comes in or another girl, a lady, comes in and she sits down and there's a gun strapped to their hip, that's the criminal division. That's the CID. That's the criminal division. They carry guns. They, they go after like drug dealers and criminals and stuff like that. If you see that, uh, you need to stop the audit at that point because the purpose of the criminal uh, division person is there the reason why they're there is because they're trying to get your client to go to jail okay this is this is no longer a civil case if you see that you go Ooh, uh, i'm going to step back from this um, i also don't do f-bar cases for that reason because f-bar can turn into a criminal case real real quick and um i'm not i don't know i don't want to be part of that okay this limited Federal, uh, federal confidential aid privilege does not apply in any criminal tax matter. So any drug dealer or anything like that. I wonder, since we're like very new on this marijuana thing, like where marijuana dispensing is becoming legal, it's legal in California, it's legal in Colorado, it's becoming legal in a lot of other states. It's still criminal for federal. federal level. And I'm kind of wondering um, how this is working. I would not take a client like that. But there's obviously people who are catering to them. There's CPE and stuff, and I do find it interesting, but you don't have confidentially privileged in that situation. And I'm, um, I would like to speak with somebody who does that because I'm really curious to how it works. Um, no banks will take them. They have to deal in cash. When they, when they pay their taxes, which they do have to pay their taxes, they have to go with like buckets of cash. So they're, it's like they come with bags, like grocery bags of cash to pay. And Colorado has, like, Colorado is, like, making money hand over fist with this. Like, hand over fist. They are rolling in dough because of this. It's, like, millions and millions and millions of dollars of extra revenue that's being flushed into Colorado. They have created, like, a separate little place where these people can go. And there's, like, armed guards and stuff where they can go and, and pay these things with these, like, 100000 in cash. It's crazy. This confidentiality privilege does not apply to any communication regarding a tax shelter. So once again, tax shelters are out. 
<laughs> in state tax proceedings, obviously that makes sense because I'm if I'm representing somebody before the franchise tax board, I'm not going to have I'm not going to assert a federal <laughs> confidentiality privilege. And then to the general preparation of tax returns, tax return information is never privileged, never. And there have been numerous cases where. There's a long history of court decisions where attorneys have tried to assert confidentiality privilege with tax return information and they cannot. The, the information that goes on the return, the whole idea is that it's not supposed to be confidential. If you put it on the tax return, then it's going to go to the IRS, so it's not confidential. And this also includes the work papers, the attorney's work papers. There's a key uh, 1983 ruling uh, that regarding this, and it's uh, United States v. Lawless. 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 I, <laughs> that's easy to remember, that's how right? I, that's how, that's how I you remember. remember so um, information that is transmitted for the purpose of the preparation of a tax return is not going to be privileged information. So the attorney can't assert, even an attorney who has privilege in criminal tax matters, cannot assert privilege um, on the return or his work papers that were going to the preparation of the return. Okay, and then I think this is the last slide. For, oh, that's identity theft. Now, identity theft is becoming a huge problem. Identity theft occurs when someone uses another individual's personal identification uh, information, such as his name, social security number, and they create a fake return. They do it usually at the very beginning of the tax season, and they put one of those stupid direct debit cards. I don't know why the IRS is still allowing this, because the 99.9% .9 of the fraud that's happening is like on a direct debit card. It's like, oh, I think just put, put two and two together. If the, the, the tax fraud guy gets that return filed in time, the IRS will usually issue the refund. They don't catch it in time. Fraudulent refunds have become a major tax issue. Now they have a name for it. It's called Stolen Identity Refund Fraud, SURF. Growing crime. Every year there's more. Uh, during last year's filing season, the IRS estimates it paid out 5.2 Billion. Billion with a B. Billion with a B. B. Do you know that the IRS's entire budget is like 10 billion? Mm -hmm. It's more than half of their budget they're paying out in fraudulent refunds. I mean, they need to do something about this. This is crazy. This is a crazy number. Billion B. It's like we can give health care to the entire United States for free. <coughs> if you could just stop this. Just stop it. They, uh, they say that they've prevented 24 billion. I don't want to know how much you've prevented. I don't care about that. I want to know how much you still paid. That's a huge number. Half of their budget. In fiscal year of 2015, the IRS has started 1,063 criminal investigations into the use of tax returns to commit identity theft. I have one on my, on my. Um, but they don't have staff. I'm telling you. Staff, but they, they need to assign staff they, to this. They don't have staff. They're not assigning staff. I, they, they, they have to fix not, it. You, I mean, it's half you, of their budget. you got to know somebody there, I, I truly, to get anything done. They, they're just not committing enough resources, and it, it's going to be more of the same until they do. I have one on my desk right now, um, and now and I'm getting notices with two addresses on them. The, the taxpayer's real name is Jose. The name that, they, they, that I keep getting the noses, noses for, it says Joseph. And then I looked up the, the, the fake address, because I know what his real address is. I filed the tax return. I filed the real tax return. I know what his real address is. I looked up the fake address, and the fake address is like one of those Regis um, addresses for like those temporary virtual offices. Virtual offices. So the scammer is getting all these tax returns filed with this virtual Regis address. I'm like, ugh. Okay, theft prevention. <clears throat> Remember, taxpayers and tax professionals are to be on alert for possible identity theft. It happens when uh, there's more than one tax return filed for a taxpayer. That's what we're seeing the more the more often. Uh, IRS records that the uh, indicate the taxpayer received wages from an unknown employer. I've seen that a lot of times too. That's more like somebody has stolen the social security number. Maybe they're like an undocumented person. And they're they're working under that fake that social that I see kind of often, but most of the time the people who are undocumented they don't file a fraudulent return. The fraudsters are doing it to to get some fake refund. But I have had this 
happened where the taxpayer had uh, wages allocated to them, because the person who was using their iSocial was also working in Sacramento. And we had to fight it and say, this is not his wages. This is somebody who's, who's working under his social and using the thing. Even the address was not the same. It's like they're using the social, but the address is they're living somewhere else. And the taxpayer was also like, I'm going to go to this guy's house and punch him in the face. I was like, I'm not, I don't recommend that you do that. Because we requested the transcripts, right? We requested their wage and income transcripts, and it popped up. So, you know, we looked. Jo Jim Jones actually lives on Main Street. But this Jim Jones is working usually at a restaurant or something like that, or a landscaping company or something. And th this person, Jim, this fake Jim Jones is working for this restaurant as a cook, and but they live on blah, blah, blah street. Because it's what's on the, uh, it's what's their, you know, they report their address to the employer so they can get their W-2 and their money and everything else. They don't think, like, to put a fake address on there. So we had the person's real address and their apartment number and everything, um, and the taxpayer wanted to go and start something. I said, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go to jail over something like this. Okay. Many phishing scams attempt to collect taxpayer social security numbers by contacting taxpayers. Uh, there's tons of phone scams. Um, I've had at least three where they called me. And um, um, I try to keep them on the phone a little bit because I think it's hilarious. The, I, my name is Jim Johnson. They have a real heavy accent and you can hear all the call center. It's like a call center, all the people screaming in the background. And um, my name is Jim Johnson. I am calling from the IRS and I am going to send you to jail. And I'm like, really, Jim Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> I play with him a little bit. Really, Jim Johnson, are you gonna send me to jail? Yes, we are sending the police to your house right now. And I'm like, the police are coming to my house, Jim Johnson? And eventually they catch on that I'm totally making fun of them. I've tried it a couple times where I wanna record them so I could like release it on a Facebook because I think it's hilarious. But um, the fact of the matter is, is this actually scares a lot of clients. Yeah, you know, older people get yeah, real they scared. They target the elderly. They target the elderly because they're an easy target. It's like, there's a special hell reserved for you people, you scammers. There's a special hell for you. Um, they do target people who, who are elderly, people, who scam yeah. old people. One of my husband's cousins got, mm. got, did this. And um, her name's... I'm not going to tell you her name, but she, she got, they called her, and she's, um, she's a green card holder, so she's super terrified that it's like the IRS, you know, she's not a U.S. citizen, and she, her English isn't that great either, and the IRS, like, the guy, the scammer is like, we are going to call the police, and we are going to send them to your house, and they will to remove your green card, and blah, 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 and she did it, and the, the, oh, no. they asked for gift cards. Yeah, they right. asked for gift cards, and she went to freaking Walgreens, and she bought four gift cards, and she mailed them the gift cards. And I was like, the gift cards didn't <laughs> give you, didn't like, <laughs> didn't like send off any red flags in your head. It's like they get, they're just like, Ugh. okay. Um, so the taxpayer, um, if the taxpayer is a victim of this or believes that someone has used his social security number fraudulently, he can submit. This is a brand new form. The 14039, and that's the identity theft affidavit. And the identity theft affidavit, remember that, because you'll be filing that form. I file at least one every tax season. So <clears throat> you can submit that form to the IRS, and you always you also submit along with the identification to verify his identity. So I submit like a utility statement, a PG&E statement, or something like that, and I also submit a copy of their driver's license usually or um, something, passport, something, to prove who they are, where they live, and the fact that they have, have become a victim of this. Okay, IP pins. IP pin is the new thing that the IRS has come up with. So if you have an identity theft victim, um, the next year the IRS will send you an IP pin. You cannot e-file the return if you do not have an IP pin. In this case, uh, sometimes you don't have an IP pin or the taxpayer has lost their IP pin and then you have to paper file because you don't have that number. The e-file will not go through. And then these tax returns take forever. Once they have an identity theft issue, that you just tell people, look, man, I know you have a refund coming. With I had a, I had a taxpayer last year. We filed uh, close to the deadline. He was on extension. We filed October 15th. He was supposed to get a $350 refund. We are in April and he still has does not have that April that refund. So that was October of last year um, and we still don't have the refund for that year it takes forever 
if the refund is, if it is missing on a paper return, there will be a delay in processing as the IRS will have to validate the taxpayer's identity. The IP pin is only valid for one year and they're gonna send you another IP pin. If the taxpayer loses their IP pin, they have to request another IP pin and they cannot request the IP pin over the phone. The IP pin has to go once again to their address and they have to bring you the letter. Sometimes it will be a spouse that, is, that has a problem. Sometimes it will be a kid, a dependent, that will have a problem. You cannot sign the tax return unless you get the pin, okay? This is something that the IRS came up with to help combat identity theft. It used to be that you could put the, um, the direct deposit into m many, many accounts, and the IRS has now limited, limited it to three accounts. It's like, why don't they just limit it to one? Limit it to one account, and that, maybe that will save us a billion dollars, a billion with a B. I don't feel like it's a big deal to have it just limited yeah, to one until, account. Until they have certain things in place. Place, yeah, to fix this. Safety, right. The, the, the thing is, is anti the scammers... Anti-fraud. Anti-fraud. Anti the scammers are like one step ahead of the IRS yeah. every time. They're one step ahead of them. Yeah. They will, if the IRS comes up with something, the, the scammers are going to come up with something. You can still deposit onto a prepaid debit. In addition, any refunds that will... that If you get an identity theft alert, if you have a problem where the IRS thinks that the refund is not supposed to be going to this taxpayer, they will reject the, the electronic refund and they will send the taxpayer a check. We've had situations where taxpayers will come in with, to me, they have not even filed their tax return and they've got a $14,000 check in their hand. If they have the huge paper check in their hand, they have not filed the return, then you know that it was a situation where there's a fraudulent return out there where they were supposed to get a refund and the IRS flagged it. And instead they send a paper check to the taxpayer and the paper check is not valid. So the IRS, don't ca they're not supposed to cash okay. it. They don't cash it. Um, we call the IRS and then we try to work it out at that point. Because um, it's not their money, right? The direct deposit limit is intended to prevent criminals from easily obtaining multiple tax refunds. They also put this in place because there's shady preparers who will put their account number on one of the deposit lines in order to get like their $300 refund fee. They're not supposed to do that. The thing is, is that's very easily traced. So, I mean, they must not care, or maybe they're doing it and they're using a fake person's thing. I don't know. Oh, we did have a case where, I'm trying to think, I was trying to think, how would this even work? Because, because bank numbers are, are traceable. You can trace who the bank account belongs to. In this case, it was a poor, like, young girl she was only like 20 and she it was her first job she was a college student she had never worked for anybody before and she was trying to make extra money she went on craigslist and she got a job on craigslist and the job on craigslist was we need your bank account information because we have vendors overseas who are sending us money we are a foreign uh business that sells products and we need to use your bank account number for the deposits and you will be our secretary. And so the girl bit into that hook, line and sinker. Your salary will come out of the money that comes into your account. And it was a tax refund fraudster overseas that we used, was using her bank account to deposit tax refunds. And then the girl wired the money to the guy. So it would come in eight thousand, would come in ten thousand, would come in six thousand, would come in fifteen thousand, and she she'd wire him the money, and she would get to keep five hundred bucks, right? And so she was so happy about this arrangement until the IRS criminal tax division came and knocked on her door seven months later, and now she's on the hook. She didn't even know at that point she had just it was like um, it was like the daughter of a client. And at that point, we didn't even know what was going to happen. She got an attorney, and the bank, of course, had closed her account, shut down her account for money laundering, which is basically what she's doing unknowingly. And that was how the guy, and the guy, the guy's like in Romania. India or Romania or whatever. He's overseas. He he disappears, but by that point, he they, he's had like fifty thousand dollars wired, which is like that's a that's a buttload of money over there. Anyway, so that's how I found out that this was working because I'm thinking, how would this scenario ever work? And that's because they get somebody here who's like their patsy or their pigeon to do it. Okay.
It's amazing to me when they in, when they implemented the direct deposit program that they would not even go so far as to match the names. They don't they match the names. Yeah, they don't match the names. Now they are. Now they're, they are. They're trying. They're trying. Yeah, they're trying to do it. Unbelievable. Um, to confirm identities, the preparer can request a picture ID. You can request a picture ID, and the IRS actually does want you to do that. Additional steps is you got to file a client's returns as early as possible. You got to e-file returns so that you get duplicate return notices as quickly as possible. And you also have to let um, taxpayers know that the refunds might take longer if it's there's fraud. Since tax return preparers are also at risk at having their identity stolen, um, they should take special precautions to safeguard their clients' sensitive information. And we're, before we go in, we're going to break now. But the IRS, uh, the IRS advice in this is in publication 947 or something like that. And one of them is like, uh, you should get a uh, a uh, filing cabinet with a lock. <laughs> it's like, it's like. <laughs> Nobody is digging through my filing cabinet to get my taxpayers' uh, information. All of this fraud that is happening is happening because they're stealing it electronically. Nobody is breaking into my office to steal that information from my client's thing. You should, get, you should really consider getting a cabinet with a lock. Follow our channel for more information about the E-Exam.